Deep in the heart of every society, there are stories that have been passed down from generation to generation, instilling a sense of fear and dread in the hearts of children. Tales of monsters and creatures real or imagined who appear out of nowhere to kidnap and devour the innocent. They have long been used as tools of discipline, but these stories are more than mere legends. They are warnings of the unspeakable horrors that lurk within society waiting for their next victim. In this case, we are looking at a murderer who inflicted pain and terror beyond measure, whose crimes are so vile that there have been attempts to remove all record of him from the internet crimes so horrific that officers who worked on the case had psychological issues for years after this. One is brutal before we start. If you find this video fascinating, then at the end please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case, it helps. Born on a desolate farm in the Krasnodar territory on August 17, 1971. I go to Shuff's life was plagued with darkness from the very beginning. His parents, both victims of chronic alcoholism, were unable to provide the nurturing environment for the young boy. Even during pregnancy, Igor's mother couldn't resist the urge to indulge in heavy drinking sessions. As a result, the child was born weak and sickly. Igor had a hard and affectionless childhood, which was marked by a constant struggle for survival. This was brought on by his parents' addiction. At the tender age of seven, Igor's father abandoned the family leaving them to fend for themselves. School was not a priority for the young Igor, and he was rarely there under age 10. He saw offered a catastrophic accident that changed his life forever. He was in a car crash, and the impact caused severe damage to his brain, leaving him with a moderate intellectual disability that doctors claimed would never improve as he struggled to cope with his newfound condition. Igor's behavior became increasingly erratic, and his mother was left no choice but to send him to a board in school for children with disabilities. Once he was at the school, his mother cut ties with him. She was no longer interested in his well-being. Igor was now alone in the world. The boarding school was a cruel and unforgiving place for Igor. The older, stronger pupils took pleasure in tormenting and brutalizing the vulnerable and defenseless boy with his frail and slender frame. Igor was no match for his attackers, and he endured frequent beatings and relentless bullying. The tormentors cruelly knew no bounds and they resorted to horrific tactics like soldering the boy's flesh, causing him lasting pain and trauma. With each passing day, Igor's mind and soul were broken as the abuse he suffered deepened his already fragile state of mind, leaving him trapped in a cycle of pain and fear. Despite graduating from the boarding school and completing a vocational school program in carpentry, Igor's dreams of a better life were quickly shattered. His work as a carpenter was short-lived, and he was forced to take up what he considered as menial jobs he worked as a milker, a cleaner, and a cook to make ends meet. Driven by his desires for a better life, he made his way to Moscow, hoping for a fresh start. However, the city's unforgiving nature proved to be too much for the vulnerable and unskilled I. Gore, he struggled to find work, and often went hungry living on the margins of society, unable to escape the harsh realities of his life. The early 90s brought a glimmer of hope to Igor's bleak existence. There was a chance encounter with a man in which he had a romance. The man was a conductor and changed everything for him. This newfound acquaintance proposed that Igor leave Moscow and follow him to St. Petersburg, where he arranged for him to work at a dishwasher in the Pegasus Cafe, which was known on the gay scene, but the bond was short-lived and the two soon charted ways alone. Once again, Igor moved to the small village of Matela Stroy near St. Petersburg in search of a new beginning. It didn't take long for Igor to ascend the ranks at the Pegasus Cafe in just a few months. He was promoted from dishwasher and became a bar waiter. Those who knew him described him as vain, self-centered, and a petty man who was always dressed fashionably and was attractive. But despite those good looks and charm, Igor's income was never enough to satisfy his desires, desperate for more money, he began accepting intimate jobs from wealthy patrons of the cafe, gradually becoming a male escort. His services were in high demand among men who had desires for hard pleasures to attract clients. Igor transformed himself, bleaching his hair and adopting a fashionable haircut. Although he had hoped for some female clients, this never materialized, and his only clientele were men. As his reputation grew, he became increasingly consumed by his dark desires, and his once vulnerable psyche was replaced by an insatiable appetite for pleasure, Despite the risks, Igor continued to cater to his clients, twisted fantasies, indulging in ever more perverse acts. He will later claim that he was repeatedly the victim of cruel torture by his clients. However, sources suggest that it was him who derived the pleasure from inflicting pain and torture upon his clients, specializing in the most twisted and depraved forms of satisfaction by mutual pleasure. Although escorting brought him a good income over time, 
the role-playing games ceased to satisfy the sadistic inclinations of the young man, his true nature was that of a predator. He began to prowl the streets looking for miners who fit his twisted criteria of apparent weakness, luring them into his clutches with a false promise of affection and protection, according to police officer Andrei Kubarev. Igor's choice of victims was driven by a sadistic impulse that was both spontaneous and calculated. He came across a defenseless and vulnerable individual he had already decided in advance what to do with them. Igor had no qualms about choosing his victim and was driven by a sadistic impulse that was both spontaneous and calculated. He came across a defenseless and vulnerable individual he had already decided in advance what to do with them. Igor had no qualms about choosing his victim and was only concerned with finding someone who was significantly weaker than him, confident that he could overpower them. In December 1993 in the city of St. Petersburg, an appalling act of violence occurred while walking in Pine Park. Igor noticed three school children all aged 11. He waited until he was certain there were no adults nearby and then approached the children with a knife. One of the children fled leaving two brothers in his clutches. Igor then forced the boys to consume alcohol and then brutally forced himself on them before fleeing the scene. Later, the victims described their attacker as a young man with a slim build, effeminate voice, blonde hair, and between the ages of 20 and 25, despite a frantic search by police, Igor remained at large, causing fear and outrage throughout the community after the attack in Pine Park. Igor hit for a month during the day he worked as a waiter, and at night he served his customers, but in February 1994, he went on a new crime that day. Igor had the day off, and he started drinking in the morning later that day on Saturday Street. The lifeless body of a nine-year-old boy was discovered in the hallway of his apartment building. The forensic report confirmed that the child had been brutally forced upon and subsequently died from asphyxiation. The investigators speculated that the killer had possibly caught the boy in the elevator or on the stairs, and after assaulting him, strangled him with his bare hands. The fact that the murder had taken place in the corridors of the child's own home terrified and outraged the neighbors. But despite extensive investigations, there were no witnesses to the heinous attack and no suspects were lurking around on the day of the crime. The investigators ran for a background check on all registered offenders in the area, but were unable to find any leads that would help them solve the case. Later, Igor would admit that he did not plan to take the boy's life or he could not control himself due to his severe intoxication. Just three months later in May 1994, another unsettling incident occurred in St. Petersburg. This time, a 10-year-old boy was brutally attacked in a building located on Ruiz Avenue. According to the boy's testimony, a man approached him near the stairs and lured him to the attic to see some nesting birds. Once inside, the boy realized that there were no birds up there and Igor strangled him until he was unconscious, then he forced himself on him. Afterwards, he inserted his fingers into his rectum and then tore out his crotch area with his bare hands. The bleeding boy managed to get down from the attic. Residents of the apartments noticed him and called an ambulance. Doctors saved his life, but the attack was so severe that he remained permanently disabled. The suspect's description was similar to that given by the victims of the earlier assault in December 1993 in Pine Park. The disturbing incident left the community in fear, with rumors spreading about a potential killer on the loose. The authorities appealed to the public for any information that could help identify the perpetrator. The calm and serene banks of the Neva River became a sight of horror when two young boys aged 11 and 12 were brutally assaulted by Igor, threatening them with a knife. Igor took the boys to a deserted place between the river pier and the Volodowski Bridge where the assault took place again. The attacker matched the description of the previous cases, a young slim blonde man with a high-pitched voice. All of the assaults had taken place between 12 and 6 p.m. on weekdays, leading investigators to speculate that the attacker was either unemployed or worked during the night as every victim was male, the authorities scoured several gay nightclubs in search of a suspect with the above characteristics, but the investigation yielded no results. The community was left in fear and despair with parents fearing for the safety of their children as rumors of a predator on the loose continued to spread. The authorities took to the airwaves, urging the public to exercise caution and be vigilant. However, the residents of St. Petersburg refused to wait for the police to apprehend the culprit and took matters into their own hands. Parents took time off work to ask got their children to and from school, while also warning them about the dangers of the streets, the entire community was on edge, and a sense of fear and uncertainty gripping the city. Despite increasing pressure and public scrutiny, 
Igor remained undeterred in his twisted pursuits, continuing to stalk the streets in search of his next victim, the hunt. For the predator intensified as the community braced itself for the next attack. They did not have to wait long, because in September 1994, Igor had spotted a 16-year-old male walking the street. Igor had noticed that it was harder to find younger victims due to the vigilance of the people of St. Petersburg, so he had to try someone a little older. He began to follow this young man through the street and into his apartment block. Igor gets into the elevator with him, and as soon as the door shut, the attack began. Igor punched the young man in the face, but to his surprise, the young man was not overawed, and he fought back, and they wrestled in the elevator until it arrived at the floor, and the doors opened when they did. The young man ran out and started banging on the apartment doors, informing everyone that the killer was in the building. Igor was scared and fled quickly, but once he got onto the street, he started to feel excitement by what had just happened. Unlike the cold-blooded predator that he is, he immediately went looking for his next victim, and he quickly spotted one he was a nine-year-old boy coming home from school. The boy rang the buzzer of his building, which was unbelievably just over the road from where I go, had just fled from his previous attack. But this didn't bother him. He was in the moment. The boy's mother let him in via intercom and buzzed the door open, but nobody noticed the man who slipped in the door behind him. The same thing as before happened. Igor got in the elevator with the young boy, and as soon as the door shut the attack happened, Ego strangled the boy until he passed out, and then he rode the elevator up to the top floor. He then dragged a boy into the utility room, where the brutal attack began. Igor inserted his fingers into the boy's rectum, tearing his crotch open, and then slowly started to rip out more than 8 meters of intestines. A truly vile act satisfied with the horror he had delivered. Igor took the boy's school bag and fled the scene the mother at this point was looking for her son. She was worried as she had only expected him to be a few minutes. She asked the neighbors if they had seen him, and she was getting worked up into a panic the boy had regained consciousness and mustered all the strength he had and crawled back to his apartment, and when his mother returned, she found him bloodied and weak on the floor. She was horrified by the I state of her boy and phoned an ambulance immediately. His life was hanging by a Fred, and the medical prognosis was not good. After six hours of surgery, they were able to stabilize him despite the severity of his injuries. The young boy had the possibility of being saved the Ruin Artificial Intestine Transplant. The procedure was exclusive to the United States and came at a steep cost. Luckily, the American specialists who would carry out the operation offered their services free of charge. Nonetheless, there were still significant expenses to cover, including travel accommodation in the hospital medical supplies, and nutrition totaling approximately half a million dollars through the kindness of strangers who learned of the boy's situation. An outstanding amount of money was raised in just 10 days, allowing him, along with his mother and grandmother, to travel to America. For the transplants, the medical team worked tirelessly over six years to save the boy's life, performing about 30 rounds of artificial intestine transplantation. Unfortunately, the boy passed away in the year 2000 before the next procedure could be completed. There was, though, some solace from the attack. Igor's fingerprints were discovered at the crime scene, and investigators conducted interviews with many potential witnesses among them. Was a young woman who reported seeing the perpetrator that day and noted a distinct scent of the popular Black Dragon lotion, which was an aftershave in the mid-90s. In addition, a 16-year-old boy who had successfully fought off Igor helped the authorities create a detailed sketch of the suspect. The sketch was then distributed as a flyer throughout St. Petersburg, published in newspapers, and regularly shown on national television. Igor himself saw this on the television and realized that he was likely to be caught soon to avoid arrest. He fled to Murmansk where he dyed his hair a different color and found refuge with a friend, but this did not last long. As his friend soon kicked him out with nowhere to go, he went back to St. Petersburg. At first he was skeptical, but then he thought that the panic had subsided, and he was able to move freely through the city he was able to survive by spending nights with his clients sleeping in their homes, where they would feed him and give him some money. He did this for a while, until one of the men with whom he was staying with noticed a bloody backpack that clearly belonged to a child. Although he did not outright think Igor was the killer on the run that everyone was looking for, he still informed the police of his discovery in no time, was quickly apprehended at the house where the bag was found. At first, the suspect declined to cooperate with the investigators. But as time went on, mounting evidence began to point towards his guilt. A number of victims identified him as their attacker, and he also learned of his fingerprint that was found at the crime scene. Additionally, he was unable to provide an explanation of why there were traces of the victim's blood on his shoes. 
In some form of effort to trick the police, he stated, I love cats very much. I always had a lot of them despite the fact that I was brought up in a board in school. I am very affectionate, I love and appreciate affection. Although he initially denied involvement, the suspect altered his approach and pretended to be mentally ill. He would cry often for no discernible reason to convince investigators of his insanity. In his view, only someone who was not sane could have committed these crimes. Igor requested to be committed to a mental hospital for life and received treatment there. Despite his efforts, Igor was unsuccessful in deceiving the experienced psychiatrists who determined that he was mentally sound. As a result, he was denied entry into the treatment facility. Igor had to wait a long time for his trial as no lawyers wanted to defend him. There was that much disdain for his actions. Whilst in prison, he carried on with his crying and screaming, still trying to convince people of his insanity, but to no avail. Other prisoners had ordered a kill on sight on his head. At this point, he was public enemy number one. When his trial finally did go ahead, it was behind closed doors, as parents and general members of the public wanted to lynch him. If they could get their hands on him, he was quickly given the death sentence, which was no real surprise, and he was taken to the infamous colony. But over time, there was a moratorium on the death sentence, so in the end, he was not put to death. He was, however, in the colony which could be argued was worse than death because of its constant torment and harsh conditions for inmates. During his time in the colony, he was tormenting other inmates with his antiques. He would laugh hysterically for hours at a time or scream in the same manner. Sometimes he may cry for days as well if he was. Not doing this, he could often be found staring at a blank wall, the head of the colony said. When Argo was detained, he was declared sane, but as time passes, everything changes. Sometimes you don't even understand what he is saying. One of the officers also spoke about Igor. He said, since his cynicism and cruelty were beyond the limits, even in comparison with everyone else. Sooner or later, this person would have come to understand that it was impossible to leave his victims alive. And we would have had a whole chain of corpses, and then perhaps they would have become even more terrible. Although this case is absolutely brutal. This could have got even worse. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay safe.